appreciate it. It's the final presentation in the architecture track here at Spring One. I, I was going to try to belt out a little bit of the final countdown, and then I remembered I can't sing, so I won't actually do that to all of you harming your poor ears. Thank you all for sticking with us here. I know there's been a ton of great presentations, but I'm very excited that we get to wrap up our day with the state of steel toe. And I know some people are like, why are we talking about like .NET stuff at a Java conference? Because it's really cool stuff, that's why. So I am delighted to have Tim with us today and we'll go ahead and pitch it over to him for the last talk here in the architecture track. Tim, take it away. Well, hey, hello there. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, thanks for coming to hear about the state of Steel Toe in the year 2020. Uh, my name is Tim Hess. I work for VMware as an engineer on Steel Toe, and I was with Pivotal before the acquisition for a grand total of about three years on this project now. Now, as a friendly .NET developer speaking at a Java conference, I'll try to avoid confirming whether or not I'm a member of the Rebel Alliance. Um, I just have to real quickly show this disclaimer. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about um, is new, it's not done yet, we may or may not ship it. Apologies if we don't, the good news is it's all open source. So if we start working on something and we drop it, but you decide you want it, you're welcome to resurrect it and take it whatever direction you see fit. Now, before I get too far into where we're at with Steel Toe today, uh, I wanted to, to just take a step back um, and, and tell a brief, fairly incomplete story that resembles what I've personally experienced as history and software development over the last 15 or so years, uh, just in order to paint the picture of why Steeltoe was started and explain some of the problems we're trying to solve with it. Now, for what it's worth, this little journey we're about to go on could also apply to present day startups that build an M on an MVP basis and really only add just the minimum amount of complexity as they go. So here we are in the beginning, um, we can usually start with just a simple website. We've got almost no traffic, so it's fine if this runs on a single instance of a server. Uh, it's probably primarily serving static content anyway. Maybe there's some JavaScript. And to make this story interesting uh, and relevant, we're going to say that this particular site runs some .NET code uh, for a shopping cart system, and it's got some generic database to store data. Um, because our product is just the best thing ever, we, we grew our customer base really fast. Uh, and that original server starts to struggle. Uh, the good news is we can just beef up the server as a Band-Aid. And we know that'll work for a little while, but obviously there's limits to how big you can reasonably make that server. And not only that, you're going to very quickly run into availability concerns. How do we patch the server operating system without taking the app offline? How do we update the app without the thing going offline? Um, very simple solution to that, relatively simple anyway. Uh, we can add a couple more servers, and now we've got this magic thing called a cluster or a server farm or whatever name you want to use. The idea is that we now have a few instances of our application running, and they don't have to be as big or as expensive anymore. But um, we didn't do anything to figure out which requests go to which server. Uh, the good news is that there's a magical thing called a load balancer out there. So that, that's great. Something that I, as a developer, don't have to manage. And it does its own internal magic to figure out uh, which application instance gets each request. So I don't even have to put it on this slide. Uh, but there's a slight problem. Uh, that shopping cart system we just built to process orders uses session state to keep track um, of, of what's in that shopping cart and whose shopping cart it is. And that started out as an in-memory process. Um, so hmm, what do we do? Uh, the good news is most load balancers come with a sticky session feature. So that just makes sure that that session gets stuck to the same server for every request. Uh, but new problem with that, um, we still have the same availability issues that we were just, just getting past. So that's not going to work either, um, but it's cool. There's uh, this idea that we can do uh, use something like a database for a distributed session store. So, OK, that problem solved, too. Um, one other thing that I kind of glossed over, that load balancer needs to know uh, whether or not an application instance is actually healthy. Um, ideally, it could figure out why it's not healthy. Um, whatever, we'll get to that problem at some point in history, I'm sure. Um, OK, we've also got now like however many instances of this application running. What happens if I need to make a configuration change? Uh, does an administrator go in and make a file change on each copy? OK, that's fine if you've got one or two instances, but what if you've got 10? Um, you can see that you start running into scale problems real fast. Um, in this, part, this architecture isn't particularly complex. We can solve a lot of problems with it. But 
we're already starting to add some complexity that we don't really care about um, as developers who are just trying to keep our shopping cart up and running. So at this point, we're obviously starting a monolithic architecture um, where the entire app is typically a, a single executable. And even in this point, some parts of the application may need to evolve at different rates, or maybe they've got different processing requirements. Maybe we've got some kind of a product recommendation class that eats up all the CPU and it just creates a big problem. So the next logical step is to start splitting this out into you know, tiny little app stacks that sort of mirror the same architecture. So the picture starts to look like this. And over time, um, these little app stacks may have followed the same history that we just walked through. Um, and, and, and that's all good. We got our immediate problem resolved, but um, okay, there's, there's a couple other problems here. Um, how does the front end talk to these individual services on the back end? Kind of a, a listing. Um, do, we, do we have a load balancer in between here? Uh, I, I don't know. That's, that's a problem that we need to figure out. Uh, but not only that, like this is just the extremely simplified logical picture. So if we blow that out into what it actually means, uh, the picture starts to look a bit more like this because, oh yeah, we probably shouldn't do our order processing from the same front end application that customers are shopping on. So there's this secondary application over here that's maybe just a, a back end system uh, for doing the order processing. And we have to add some kind of centralized security authority here. So obviously this picture got really complex really fast. So let's maybe break it down and start talking about what the concerns are that we've, that we've raised that are things that we now as developers have to deal with beyond the business logic that we actually care about. So we've got the centralized configuration we already mentioned. Um, are we doing some kind of service discovery or registration to figure out where these backend services are? How are we communicating with these services? Are we using HTTP, gRPC? Maybe we're doing some form of message queuing. Um, how are we doing security here if it's HTTP? How are we making sure that it's not open to the whole world? Are we passing user credentials forward? If we are, how do we know they're actually valid? Maybe there's a separate system for authentication and authorization with the service-to-service -service communications. Um, what kind of resilience patterns are in use here? Are we using circuit breakers, uh, retry mechanisms? How do we uh, keep this communication flowing without creating internal denial of service attacks? Um, we talked about resource health a little bit. Um, this is now a lot of things that we have to keep track of. How do we know that it's all healthy? How do we know what's not healthy? Um, sometimes we have management tasks, whether it's data migrations for a service or schema changes, you need to have some kind of a, a plan for how you handle this stuff. Is there any kind of function uh, involved? Are all of these services the same communication mechanism? Are they some kind of platform specific function technology? You know, after all these concerns, what happens with uh, data processing or warehousing or analytics? What, have, how are we figuring out what people are liking the best? Uh, is there some kind of a pipeline that needs to be involved here? This gets to be really complicated really fast. And if you take a step back, you'll realize that this is just the technical problems of running the application in production. We have a lot to figure out to even get to this point. So, what happens uh, when we need to start a new project? Do we have a baseline list of what packages are acceptable to use? Do we have minimum versions that need to be used? Do we know that the packages work together or is it just a complete free for all and everybody gets to do whatever they want? Where are we storing all the source code for all these different services? Is there some kind of development environment tooling that the whole team should use? Does that have anything helpful um, to deal with all of this complexity that we've got going on here? How are we testing these services when we deploy them? to make sure that they're still speaking the same language and that things aren't surprise breaking on us. Um, and on top of that, what does it look like to actually ship all of these things? So you can see real quickly that there's a lot of questions that need to be answered in order to run these complex modern architectures. Some of them, like source control, have, have hopefully been answered long time ago by most organizations that are doing software development. Um, and for those of us that are in the .NET space, Microsoft does a great job of offering lots of solutions for us to, to many of these problems. It, but sometimes they cost too much, or maybe they don't work the way we want them to, or maybe it's just not the right tool for the job that we're trying to do. When you throw all of these problems together and you look at from all these different angles, you start to understand the need for a broad open source project that can tackle these kind of problems. 
So in this environment, Steel Toe was started. And back in 2015, it, there weren't many solutions to a lot of these problems, particularly for .NET. I mean, .NET Core wasn't even a thing yet. So Steel Toe aims to provide or prescribe solutions to most of these kinds of problems for .NET environments. And also because many companies have both .NET and Java and, oh, that's right, we are at Spring 1. Uh, we're also here to provide some level of interoperability with Spring where it makes sense. So what's actually in Steel Toe today? Well, it's more than a couple of things. Uh, some of the components that you see in this list uh, provide their own abstractions because nothing existed in .NET when we started with them, like service discovery or connectors um, or, or management. Um, but others plug into existing Microsoft tooling, like our configuration providers and most of the security functionality. Those are just customized versions of what Microsoft had all already available. So we're not completely making this up as we go along. Um, everything you see on this list with an asterisk, it's either brand new in the last year or it's had significant changes recently. So now if I went back to that list of problems that I was just talking about a couple of slides ago, you'll find answers for a lot of them on this list. And when it comes to centralized configuration, um, we've got a configuration provider for Spring Cloud Config Server. When you talk about locating backing services, uh, we have a variety of options for doing service discovery. When you talk about service to service communications, we've got some security packages that can help with that. Um, and also the new messaging and streams uh, packages can help out if you're doing queue-based systems event sourcing, whatever terminology you want to do to use around that space. Uh, we've got the Hystrix circuit breaker to help out with resilience. We've got um, health tooling in the form of uh, management endpoints, whether that's actuators, or heap dumps, uh, trace lists. There's, there's a whole collection of tooling in management that can help with that kind of um, situation. We've got a package for doing management tasks so that you can, um, you can actually embed a management task in your application when you deploy it, and you can run this task in the context of your application in whatever environment it happens to be running in. Now, I mentioned functions, and we don't have anything um, specifically for dealing with functions yet. Um, it's one of the things that we're, we've got somewhere on our roadmap for future consideration. Uh, when it comes to data, data tooling, whether that's ETL or uh, basically moving data from one place to another, you may be familiar with Spring Cloud Dataflow. We don't have that functionality yet because of all of the building blocks that we needed to put in place to provide that level of compatibility, but it's coming soon. When you talk about managing templates and figuring out you know, what does a baseline look like for an application in my enterprise? Uh, we've got the Steel Toe Initializer available uh, with more enhancements coming soon. Um, when it comes to IDEs with tooling, we're not building our own IDE, but we are uh, working on some, some tooling to help inside your development environment to make it easier to work with some of this complex stuff. Uh, we don't have our own complex or our own tooling for um, integration testing at this point. Um, there's been some experimentation with Spring Cloud Contracts, so there's potentially room for some uh, future development there. Uh, when it comes to continuous integration and continuous deployment, there's already a lot of tooling in there, so Steelto is not likely to do anything uh, specifically in that space, but there are a bunch of other VMware projects like build packs, maybe, for example, that could be useful to help solve problems in that space. This is the last time I'm going to talk about Circuit Breaker today. Um, there's There's been it's still, it's still there and still actively maintained. Um, there's just nothing else to say about it at this point. Um, and also, uh, we've previously shipped a lot of packages for AutoFact support and .NET Framework. I'm not going to be talking about those at all again the rest of today either. What are we talking about the rest of today? Well, it's, it's broken out into these categorizations. I obviously got super creative with other. Um, we'll, we'll get to what that actually means later. OK, so Steel Toe has grown up as a collection of packages with varying levels of interconnectedness. And sometimes that resulted in what appeared to be ties to a certain platform that weren't necessarily necessary or what we intended. Um, as a result, we landed in a situation where it might have seemed like Steel Toe was maybe only for Cloud Foundry-based platforms. But that was more a side effect of our focus than anything that was actually intentional. So in the last year, uh, we took many of the defining aspects of our components and we moved them out into these separate, extremely small abstraction packages. They might seem somewhat familiar. Um, all of the Microsoft's 
uh, packages recently have their own abstraction packages. They were kind of following their lead on this one. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and I, I still think it's a great idea. So that's the direction we're headed. Uh, you could say that these packages are intended to form a sort of a blueprint for the foundation of what steel toe libraries can or should do. And additionally, with these changes, uh, we were able to reduce that interlinking between steel toe packages and the specific implementations that make up our components. So with this loosened coupling, you should actually have an easier time building onto and extending the behaviors that we have in steel toe today. So what does that actually look like? Well, from a packaging perspective, that means 10 new packages. Um, obviously, you see that list on the screen. And ideally, these are our best documented packages as well. So if you um, find these and you're poking around and you see something and we forgot to add some XML comments, let us know and we can help identify much more specifically about what that thing is actually for. So with this abstraction split, this new foundation that we're doing our best to define well, is taking us towards better and broader platform support. Uh, by the nature of the history of this product, uh, with most of the contributions coming from Pivotal and now VMware employees, there's been a lot of attention on supporting Cloud Foundry, specifically Pivotal Cloud Foundry and now VMware Tansu. That's not been a bad thing for us. There's a lot to love there, and it really makes development simple and straightforward. And that's helped us identify some guiding principles and priorities for the last few years. But with all that being said, SteelToe was always destined for more. And it was never intended to only run on one cloud, even if that cloud can run on other clouds. So our work leading up to last year's spring one was beginning um, to think about how we might write a single app that could run on many platforms. And since then, we've been working on rebuilding this ground layer in order to more naturally support that end goal. So with this release, we're beginning to add support for Kubernetes, um, another cloud that runs on any clouds. Um, and, and most of that is in the form of packages that can directly interact with the Kubernetes Management API. As a result of the abstractions work, um, we've been able to do this without taking any dependencies on our Cloud Foundry related packages and without introducing any Kubernetes related dependencies to components where that is they aren't required. So one other general change um, that I want to note before we move on is that um, in Steeltoe 3.0, uh, we are not worried about .NET Framework. SteelToe 3.0 is for .NET Core. Uh, packages that are in SteelToe, some packages that are in SteelToe 3.0 do still work with .NET Standard where it makes sense. But please be aware that if some aspects of SteelToe 3.0 do work with .NET Framework, that it's not necessarily by design. It's not something that's in our integration testing. So you're gonna be in a little bit of an unsupported path if you try to head down that road. We are still actively supporting .NET Framework in our 2.x line. So if you're still on .NET Framework code, please don't feel like we're leaving you behind. We absolutely still want to help you out. Um, in fact, we're going to be shipping a maintenance release on the 2.x line in this month. OK, on to configuration. So on the, form of, on the theme of forming a solid foundation, we took some of the ideas that we previously had inside of our Cloud Foundry configuration provider, and we abstracted them, we extracted them, put them in a more generally accessible location. Specifically, I'm talking about uh, the attributes that have historically been provided by the VCAP variables on Cloud Foundry. So these properties include things like the application's name, at least as viewed by the platform, IP addresses assigned to an application instance, the port, the URIs, and any uh, credentials for services that might be bound to that application. So not all of these properties make sense on all platforms. Uh, so there might be some further evolution here, but the point is that we've been working on this generic foundation that in this case um, defines the basics of what an application is on any app, any given platform. Um, additionally, we've added support for doing mutual TLS with Spring Cloud Config Server, so you can use a client certificate for your authentication uh, there as well. There haven't been any significant changes for the placeholder or random value providers, but if you didn't know that we have them, now you know. Okay, so Kubernetes configuration is the biggest, probably the biggest feature change in this area. Um, so this, we now have um, configuration-related Kubernetes support um, built on top of the official Kubernetes client for .NET. 
this client's a bit of a heavyweight coming in at, I think it's like five megabytes for the NuGet package. Um, so you want to be sure that you want it before you pull it down. Um, but it gets the job done for now. Uh, we have configuration providers for config maps and for secrets. They use some familiar conventions um, that should look at least somewhat similar to the way app settings work. Um, we obviously had to do something other than the name app settings, so we just went with the app name. And that comes from the Spring application name or the Spring Cloud Kubernetes name. There's several uh, various keys that can be used to determine what that app name is. You want to check our documentation over at steeltoe.io uh, to get some more specifics. That turn headset back on. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, OK, so by default, this will search the default namespace. Um, but you can change that with configuration. Again, you'll want to check the documentation for that. And you can also specify additional um, config maps or secrets to search for in the configuration. Now, anytime you're dealing with externalized configuration, it's a good idea to have a plan for how you um, want to get that updated within each application instance. So we've got several options for reloading that with Kubernetes configuration. And there they are. The first option is don't do anything. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is going to be the default behavior. So if you only want the application instances to get configuration when they first start, you're ready to go with the defaults. If you want to check on an interval, we have an option for doing polling. Uh, by default, it'll poll the management API every 15 seconds. And you can adjust that on a, on a second basis. Uh, finally, there's event-based reloading. So with this method, the Kubernetes client will open a WebSocket to the management API. And anytime there's a, a change with any one of the objects that we're trying to monitor, the app instance will get a notification, and then we'll update the, the app data that way. Now, if you're asking yourself which one of these methods you should use, I'm going to suggest it's going to depend on your environment. Uh, Event-based is pretty cool for local development scenarios where you probably aren't operating at scale, uh, but you want to get that, that real-time interaction and get your configuration updated immediately. Uh, and you're not, not so much concerned about having a whole bunch of open sockets. OK, that's about it for configuration. Um, again, there's a whole lot more in our documentation about that. And you'll definitely want to, to check that out if this is something that interests you. Connectors. Um, historically, this feature has been pretty Cloud Foundry or Tanzu specific, uh, being that it's been most useful in an environment where you've got uh, VCAP services. But with this release, again, we've worked to pull apart the Cloud Foundry dependency and the underlying abstractions. So you should only depend on the code that you actually need. And ideally, we've got a, a more generic foundation to start from, which should be more useful in more places. We don't have any other platform-specific implementations of it yet, because uh, at least as far as I'm aware, there aren't really any other platforms out there that have uh, similar functionality for us to adapt this to. I'm specifically excluding Heroku here because they don't support .NET. Uh, there are a couple of projects for Kubernetes that are promising. And we'll definitely be paying close attention to the Kate's service bindings project as it gets closer to uh, being ready for consumption. Uh, the way we separated the Cloud Foundry bits uh, was by introducing some new extensibility points, which is cool. Um, but I don't really want to go too far in depth in here because, at least in my opinion, this is one of the areas that we hope you don't really have to know too much about. Um, and you can just rely on it working. But at the most basic level, uh, most backing resources can be represented by something called a service info, which is really just this class that's built on raw credential information. Um, and something called the service info factory knows how to build the service info, and it knows whether the credentials are for that kind of service info. And all of this stuff is managed by a thing called a service info creator. If you need or want to know more about how it all works, um, you can check out the link on this slide later um, that just goes to our documentation. and. Um, you can find me on GitHub, on Slack, or on Twitter if you have some questions. Um, in order to make all of that work, we added some new assembly level attributes and some language that we put in Steeltoe Common for using reflection to find classes based on these assembly attributes. And I think it's cool because I've worked on the framework stuff. If you're not doing framework stuff that's using reflection, you probably don't care. And that's totally fine. I get it. 
I wouldn't care if I didn't need it. Um, again, details are available on demand. So the one big side effect of these changes is that if you're migrating from some uh, 2.x version, whether it's 2.4 or 2.3, whatever, um, you're going to need an extra reference that's not immediately obvious, and that's the Steel Toe Connector Cloud Foundry package. The code will all work the same um, from the experience perspective, um, but you will need to remember to add this, um, or else when you deploy the Cloud Foundry, it's not going to find your bindings, and that's going to be a potential issue. Uh, we've also added support for Cosmos DB. It works with the v3 or v4 client library, and it should work with any service broker that can work with Cosmos DB. And something that I found interesting was working on these two new access mechanisms for working with the connectors logic. The first one is the connection string manager. Um, this one is actually probably a little bit more over it, more than a year old. Uh, we didn't talk about it much. Um, but this class operates by taking in your app configuration and then hooking into all the underlying uh, connectors logic that we already had. And it just provides a, a more directly accessible means of getting at your credential information. So um, when you do this dot get, it will return some typed connection info that will include your connection string, maybe a name of the binding. And sometimes it will include some additional metadata that you might need. Um, such as if you're using the GCP service broker and Postgres, you're going to need to um, plug in some uh, client certificate information. Uh, the other new method is the connection string configuration provider. Um, it's very new, but this is uh, kind of a neat little shim that hooks the connectors logic in with kind of Microsoft's default recommendation for interacting with connection strings. Um, usually they recommend you just plug in your connection strings in a node in your configuration, similar to like what you see on the slide, and then access it with this extension method. Well, now with this shim in place, we can say, um, hey, .NET, I know that my connection string is a Postgres thing, and I know that it's going to be changed at runtime, and so just go ahead and hook all this stuff together. Um, so that's that's accessible just by plugging in the connection strings configuration provider, as you can see on the slide. Um, and that just makes it kind of a, a neat, more natural experience compared to how you might have uh, interacted with um, connection strings without steel toe. It is worth pointing out here that if you use this method instead of uh, the uh, the service collection extensions that we have normally recommended, you will not get a health contributor automatically injected for you. So if you're uh, wanting to use health contributors that are reading from your connection strings, there's an extra step that you'll have to go through in order to make that work. But we do typically have um, extensions for getting those uh, health contributors for any given service uh, independently. OK, service discovery. This one's also had a, a bit of work done. In this release, uh, we rerouted the plumbing that's used to set up service discovery for your application. And this is going to have some pretty big impact, uh, but I'll get into that on the next slide. Uh, we've also either added or improved mutual TLS support for Eureka. And that's depending on your perspective, whether it was added or improved. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say on this, other than it, it's not extremely hard to do now. <laughs> it's a much more, uh, it's, there's a much more natural way to do it. Uh, we've had this uh, configuration-based discovery option for a while. Um, it's not really service discovery, because it's really just a means of connecting configuration with the iDiscovery client. Uh, we originally put it in place for unit testing, specifically with the load balancer. But uh, we had it. We've been shipping it. So now it's more directly accessible if you've got a, a simpler scenario where you do want to just do that mapping of host name and port to a service name. Or maybe you're trying to, to debug a, a production issue with one specific service instance, and you want to isolate it. Uh, this would be one way to do that. Uh, we've also added a client for doing uh, for discovering service instances with Kubernetes Management API and a no-op client for when you're deploying to a platform like Kubernetes um, that can do its own load balancing internally, um, but you still want to use the iDiscovery infrastructure. So the details of this inter-package relationship change. Um, the core of Discovery is now in a new package called Discovery Client Base. And it doesn't have references to uh, the complex clients anymore. So if you're familiar with the way that we were doing it before, you would pull in a reference to discovery client core, 
And that included references to each of the Discovery Client implementations. So you would get Console and Eureka, um, which wasn't as big of a deal when it was just those two and they were really lightweight and small. But when we added um, this Kubernetes-based one, which includes, again, the, a reference to the, the official Kubernetes client, all of a sudden you'd be getting this huge dependency pulled down that you may not ever use. So that was kind of the, the need for why we had to do this now. Um, but also because we built all this in the client base and we didn't want uh, to force an ASP.NET Core dependency on you, we had to separate that out, leave it in the client core package. So that's where you've now got extensions kind of going outward in two different directions from this uh, client base. So that it does increase the number of package references you'll need, but it should be lighter and you should only get what you need it, uh, when we do it this way. Um, if it seems familiar, it is loosely based on how Entity Framework Core is configured. Um, in that you've got uh, this, this method of adding the core abstraction to your project, and then you can optionally specifically configure it. Uh, speaking of that specifically, this is, uh, this is what the code actually looks like here. Um, so these options are gonna be for how you do it when you're working with the generic host builder. So all of this code is available in all this, most of this code is available in that uh, client base package. Uh, but there's also identical code available for Web Host Builder. And there are very similar options um, for adding it directly to the service collection if you'd rather do this kind of setup in your startup CS. Although you'll have to remember to activate the client in um, your app builder if you're going to do it that way. You're, you're going to want to check out the documentation for more detail on how to do this if you need more than just this one liner. Um, if you prefer the style we offered before, where your code just says, hey, I want to add a discovery client, and we'll just we'll just figure it out at runtime, which one that actually is, um, then you're actually all set with the, the methods that we've been shipping um, since the beginning of time, this add discovery client. Um, you will need to add or change your NuGet references. So if you want to be able to toggle between Eureka and console, you want to add references to both of those packages. And we will use reflection uh, under the covers to figure out all of the discovery clients that have been included. And we will evaluate each of them to see which one is configured. If you have multiples that are included and configured, we'll throw an exception so you'll know right away at startup, hey, this isn't going to work. Um, if you're not a fan of doing reflection here, um, or if you know that you're only ever going to use one option, you have the option to do the second method where you can say, I want to add service discovery and I want to only add Eureka. And then you should only ever have it configured for that one client. And now the, this option, particularly that first one with that discovery client, this is how we've always wanted it to work. And we just never got around to like actually connecting it this way. So this was uh, a nice change. It's, it's fine to see finally come to fruition. So on the subject of service discovery on Kubernetes, um, when you deploy an app to Kubernetes and you tell Kubernetes, hey, this needs to listen on a port, um, a service, very greatly named, is uh, automatically registered for you. So our discovery client doesn't have to do any work here. So that's kind of neat from our perspective. It just starts up and it's registered. Um, but we are still able to find um, the specific instances by using the built-in service and endpoint objects that are created to represent them. So like the configuration providers, this functionality is built on top of the official Kubernetes client for .NET. And again, because it's so large, uh, that's why um, we needed to build this so that it wasn't automatically pulled in. Excuse me. Um, so the, the process of rebuilding this also means that we have now the option for having multiple versions of Kubernetes service discovery. So there's another uh, Kubernetes client out there that is a bit lighter weight because it's it does its cogeneration differently. Um, so we could if, if anybody wanted to build a different iDiscovery client that was based on .NET Kube client instead of the official client, or um, what we'll probably definitely, more, very likely do in the next little bit here is um, do a different Kubernetes discovery client based on informers, which is a concept that has existed over on the Go side for a while. And um, we have a project in our incubator that is bringing informers to .NET and it will allow you to use a link syntax in order to interact with uh, Kubernetes constructs. So that's going to be an extremely exciting project. And you can definitely look forward to hearing more about that in the near future. Um, since Kubernetes does have this built-in uh, registration and discovery capability, uh, we added this no-op client. 
um, so that you can you can still use the iDiscovery client infrastructure for for doing all of this work, and then you have the option of either um, falling back to it or growing out of it if you decide that you you do want to do something more complex than what's built in. It, you, if you build it into your application from the beginning, you can more or less flip a switch um, and and go either up or down in the level of integration you want there. It's enough about discovery. Let's talk about management for a little bit anyway. Uh, my teammate Hananiel delivered a talk yesterday that was much more focused on um, observability and all of the stuff that we have in steel toe management. So I'm going to be glossing over most of it, and you'll want to check out the recording of his talk if you missed it. Uh, very briefly, um, Open Telemetry is now here instead of Open Census. Um, this was just an evolutionary change. Um, Open Census is more or less going away, and Open Telemetry is the new hotness now. Um, Prometheus support um, you can now exports Prometheus. That's kind of the way things are going to to work with that format. Uh, Spring Boot Admin, if you're not familiar with it, is an open source dashboard that was built for Spring Boot ad, uh, Spring Boot apps. But because our actuators are compatible with Spring Boot, we're compatible with Spring Boot Admin, and now there's a, a simple mechanism for registering uh, your app instances with that dashboard so that you can have it on wherever you want to run it. Um, this is next one's a bit of an internal change, um, but our actuators are now using the built-in endpoint routing instead of a completely custom middleware that had to evaluate the path and the, the verb and, and all of that to decide whether or not to act. Uh, we also have a brand new add all actuators method, which was added at the same time as that endpoint routing change. Uh, and it was somewhat related um, how that functionality all came together. Um, but this is this is cool for using actuators on a platform that's not Cloud Foundry. Now you can get a single statement that will add all of them at once and you can figure you can configure them on and off and and exposing or not exposing details with your app configuration. This one you're gonna want to check the documentation. That's more than I could probably cover in a in this talk. Um, we also have an add Kubernetes actuators that builds on top of that, and it adds a Kubernetes info contributor. So if you use this add Kubernetes actuators and you deploy to Kubernetes, you will instantly get some info on your, um, actu your info actuator endpoint that includes information about uh, the Kubernetes cluster that you're in, what the pod, uh, pod information, like the IP address and the port, and um, just general information that's kind of cool to have. And we've also got heap dumps available on Linux. Uh, this one was actually a contribution from Microsoft, somebody who works on that diagnostics team. So that was real cool to see that involvement. Thank you for your contribution there. Um, the health groups was the last big feature that we worked on here. So let's go a little bit more in depth on that. Uh, this was specifically done really for Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes uses uh, the concepts of liveness and readiness to determine whether or not to route traffic to an application instance and if that instance is healthy or not. Um, for Steeltoe, both of these are powered by a new application availability class, which is essentially just a dictionary of state. And at this point, we added hooks that fire at startup um, to initialize this state. So when your app starts, we automatically say, hey, it's ready, hey, it's alive. And you have the freedom and flexibility to alter that state based on your own logic if you want to do that or need to do that. Um, that's not something we could really manage for you because I, I couldn't tell you why you have a given health contributor and whether or not it affects whether or not that instance is actually available. So that's something that you would have to manage on your own. Um, with the way we built this functionality, uh, we also provided a way for you to define you to define your own health groups. So if you have some number of health contributors included in your application, uh, you now have a, a very simple way to configure them into groups. So you can say that, you know, I want to check the health of just this small subset. Um, this example on the screen is kind of weird. I don't know why you would care about the disk space in one specific database, but maybe that's what you want to do. And maybe you wanted to specifically exclude one health contributor from a certain kind of health check. Now you can do it with this configuration and by accessing it with that path. Um, I should also note that we are maintaining compatibility with Microsoft abstractions. So if you're using something like the Beat Pulse library um, and any number of other um, health contributors that are compatible with those interfaces, we can read those as well here. So you're free to mix and match to your heart's content. That's it for management. Um, next up is messaging, which is an absolutely humongous feature, and I'm not going to do it justice today. 
because uh, it could probably be a talk all on its own. Um, but we're going to do an extremely quick overview of it. And if there's time at the end, I will do uh, a walkthrough of the sample that we have so I can just show you how simple it is to get started with it. But long story short, this feature has been in the works for over a year for us. And it is just uh, so big to build compatibility with the spring functionality here because that's been built on years and years and years of work. Um, so we've been focused on support for RabbitMQ. So more or less porting spring AMQP over to .NET uh, in order to build this experience. So that means that there's a whole pile of new code in Steeltoe Common. There's this new Steeltoe integration project. And then there's also Steeltoe messaging, specifically Steeltoe messaging RabbitMQ. And then there's also some preliminary support for streams, which is, of course, going to be our Our jumping point to get into uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow. And hopefully my mic is still working. And OK. Oh, the joys of wireless technology. OK. Um, Spring Cloud Bus is also in the mix here somewhere. That's going to be the prerequisite for supporting live reload of data from the Spring Cloud config server. And of course, Kafka support will be coming probably as soon as we have support for RabbitMQ from front to back, meaning. Once RabbitMQ works in Dataflow, we will start working on the Kafka support. If Kafka support is important to you, we'd love to have some community contribution here. It's just a matter of focus for the core team and getting something complete before trying to, to build out more. OK, let's talk about security. Uh, the big update for security in Steeltoe 3.0 is service-to-service -service mutual TLS. Whew, that's a mouthful. Uh, this is uh, specifically with support for rotating certificates. And we also included some uh, Cloud Foundry or Tanzu specific authorization policies, like same org and same space. So with this functionality, um, especially on, on those platforms, you now have a, an exceptionally low effort way to use certificates that are automatically provisioned and rotated by the platform to secure these inter-service communications. So back to that idea of, of what do I do with service-to-service -service communications? Now we provide something that with just a couple of lines of code, you can ensure that all calls to that service are coming from within this platform. And you can even lock it down to say the, only this space. So if it's maybe it's a, a service that's related to finances, um, you can say the, the app has to be in the finances space or else it can't talk to this endpoint or this controller or this entire service. So that's a, a ton of power um, available in a really tiny package. And it was uh, it's built on top of what was really, I think just included in, in ASP.NET Core 3.1, and that's this uh, certificate authentication library. Um, but again, customized to this environment. Uh, we do still have single sign-on packages for OAuth 2.0, OpenID Connect, JWT authentication. And this Redis data protection, those are all um, pretty Cloud Foundry, uh, UAA, um, Tanzu single sign-on specific. Uh, this Cred Hub client is, I don't think, highly used. Um, could probably use a little bit more attention if anybody does want to use it, but we'd be happy to update it if it's something that um, anybody cares about. OK, lastly, not lastly. Should have updated my notes. Uh, other general updates, uh, tooling. Um, we we started uh, this tooling effort probably two years ago now. Um, the Steeltoe CLI has been out there for a while. Uh, we actually put it on hold. Uh, Microsoft kicked up their own project tie. If you've been following our CLI project and thought it was going to be interesting, well, Microsoft thought so too. And so now there's this project tie, which has a really cool dashboard. And if you're not familiar with it and you care about things that Steeltoe cares about, you're definitely going to be interested in this project tie. Um, we're probably going to be looking at it in the near future and seeing if we can't uh, do something to make Steeltoe apps run exceptionally well over there. Um, it already does a lot of things really well for microservices, specifically ones that are headed towards Kubernetes. Um, but there's, there's more that we can do there to make uh, Steeltoe a first-class citizen. Uh, we're also in the, process, in the final stages, actually, of re-architecting re -architecting Initializer. Um, we've had it out there for a while. Um, it's cool to see the usage grow and see people get used to the idea of um, using a tool like Initializer to get started with these packages. Um, but this re-architecture is, is now we're going to build it all around a NuGet package. Um, 
So it's much, much easier to distribute it this way. And we will be building our front end off of the same NuGet package that we would encourage you to download and do your own front end. So you could potentially fork our front end, but then um, not have to worry about updates from our front end to your front end project. And you just manage your UI from your perspective and, and, and keep it going forward that way. Uh, across the board, we've done our best to improve the one-liner experience. Um, so whether it's just getting started or, you know, up, however you want to look at it, um, I think it's really um, fantastic and flexible to be able to add a single line statement into your program CS uh, file to just say, I want to add Cloud Foundry configuration. I want to add actuators. Excuse me. Um, just this idea that you should be able to quickly get up and running and get back to the things that you actually care about, like how do we how do we sell things in our shopping cart? How do we do product recommendation? You know, whatever whatever it may be that the business problem is that you're trying to solve, uh, we should be able to provide you ways to do it with less code. Um, another very small update, uh, but we are now automatically disabling color um, when you're running on a Cloud Foundry based platform with the uh, dynamic console logger. If you've ever looked at that kind of output, you might notice a bunch of weird character codes like numbers and brackets and stuff that just doesn't make any sense. That's because that, um, that interface can't process those color codes. So now we'll just turn them off for you automatically. Um, there's nothing you have to worry about doing to enable that. We've also made some improvements to, to the way um, all of the, all the stuff is set up between uh, dynamic logging between Serilog, our dynamic logger, and the logger's actuator, there are more scenarios that are supported automatically. So if you add, um, if you do it in a weird way, we will fail in a more friendly way, um, or if you do it in a way that we can automatically recover from. So like um, the add all actuators uh, method will do some automatic setup of uh, the dynamic logger. And um, if you have added Serilog first, we might have thrown an error before, but now we're saying, hey, it looks like serial log is already there. So we'll just continue without error and we won't bother trying to add another dynamic logger when there's already one there. Um, we've also updated most of our HTTP client usage um, so that the clients are kept around longer and aren't being disposed of after a single usage. There was a lot of controversy about this um, in the recent past. Uh, in terms of how HTTP clients documentation wasn't necessarily uh, the best and how most of the examples were wrong. Uh, we never had any actual real complaints about it causing issues for us, but um, our usage has now been updated to follow the best practice guidance. And in the process, we also uh, set that up to provide a user agent. So if you happen to be checking your usage logs from Eureka or config server, you will now see a user agent that identifies the client as Steeltoe and the specific version of Steeltoe that was used. We've also reduced our usage of Newtonsoft. We are on the path towards eliminating it completely um, in favor of uh, system text JSON. We're not, um, we, we never really used most of what's in Newtonsoft, so it was, it was a far bigger tool than, than we ever needed. And because of the, the risk of creating versioning incompatibilities, or some people just really aren't fans of Newtonsoft. I mean, I guess I don't really care. We, we really only need this bare minimum tool that's provided by system text JSON. So that's going to be just fine for us. Uh, we've also made a bunch of general improvements across the board to add more comments. And we've worked to improve the naming and behaviors in places where it maybe wasn't consistent between different methods. Um, or maybe one specific example was we had this host builder extension that was named Add Cloud Foundry. But if you see an extension that says Add Cloud Foundry on the host builder, you might ask yourself, Add Cloud Foundry, what? How am I adding a Cloud Foundry to my host builder? Um, so that was renamed to Add Cloud Foundry configuration um, to make it at least a little bit uh, more straightforward. Now, I previously mentioned some community contributions. Um, I think I tagged all the ones I specifically called out. Uh, the heap dumps on Linux, uh, that was the Microsoft employee. Um, thank you, Tom, for your work with the Kubernetes discovery client. Thank you, Andrew, for your, your inspiration and your assistance with doing the service to service mutual TLS. And thank you to everybody else for all of your contributions. They are greatly appreciated and we love to see uh, people getting involved. So what is coming up next? Well, the rest of this year, actually, 
somebody wanted to ship this a couple of weeks ago, uh, but we're going to be doing a uh, another, um, I don't know, update, I guess, to our documentation site. It's going to be built with DocFX, which if you've not worked with it before, uh, my understanding is the, the documentation on DocFX is a little bit weak, but there's an insane amount of power there. So you should see some dramatic improvement to our documentation site. So that should make it a lot easier to, to get started with Steel Toe to get into the depths of how things work. Um, a lot of cool, um, we've been doing a lot of work with or getting it started in our documentation. Um, so if you haven't been to our doc site in a while, you should um, to check out the site and go see all the new stuff. Um, and we're now that we've done all this work to make it make Steel Toe more generic and more accessible on more platforms, we're really working on building out the documentation for explaining how to do it in different places. Um, and we'll really be kind of fleshing out the details and what that actually looks like in all these different places that you might want to run your .NET application. Um, on the Steel Toe 3.x line, uh, we're definitely looking to take streams from experiment to production ready. And on top of that, we'll be building Spring Cloud Dataflow integration and um, ideally, you will it will be completely interoperable. You should be able to send and receive between Spring and Steel Toe, and it's going to be cats and dogs living together, and I don't know stormtroopers and uh, rebel pilots hanging out at the barbecue. Uh, we're looking to also add uh, blue green deployment support with Discovery. Uh, what this means is really just a, a new actuator that will basically take application instances online and offline. Um, it should be a relatively straightforward, but also extremely useful utility. Uh, we're obviously going to continue with general maintenance, um, particularly on the 3.x line. Uh, we've done a huge amount of refactoring um, and a huge amount, added a huge amount of codes. So there's you know, more stuff that we need to make sure is covered with tests and do some performance testing. Um, so th there'll be more focus on general refinement and these smaller little extensions or um, feature areas and much more focus on maintenance for the rest of the year in particular. Uh, Still to, to X, like I already mentioned, we're planning a maintenance release for later this month. It's already got these things included. Um, those first two are, are not a huge deal. Um, we're planning to, well, we already have marked a lot of things obsolete that go away in 3.0. So that should help um, with the transition to 3.0. If you wanted to wait for that 2.5, you'll see a lot of things that are automatically marked. Hey, this thing is going away. You'll still be able to use it, um, but you'll get uh, a warning that it is going away. Um, we also had raised that some of the uh, credentials that were being provided through Steel Toe were being in it, we're in a URI encoded format. So now we're automatically handling that. Um, so you should never have to worry about um, saying this connector needs to deal with URI encoded credentials or not. After that, uh, we are absolutely planning on a lot more and better Kubernetes support, uh, specifically starting with informers and also um, maybe doing some additional utilities for building um, what I'm going to call infrastructure style apps in .NET. Um, the, the .NET Core team has this mission of running .NET everywhere, and while we're not uh, the .NET Core team, um, that's also something that is interesting to me and uh, something that kind of overlaps with our space is this idea of cloud-native modern applications doing more for Kubernetes. Um, so look to see a lot more Kubernetes, .NET, Steel Toe coming together, um, fun developments. Um, we're also uh, looking to build more and better tooling. Uh, we've been working on initializer. I already mentioned this this architecture change with the NuGet package. You will hopefully see some more integrations with the .NET CLI, with Visual Studio, maybe Visual Studio Code. Um, just generally trying to improve uh, that phase of the developer experience. And we've also got on our roadmap support for working with open service broker APIs. Um, again, this is. Uh, in the same vein of infrastructure style apps, um, potentially as, as part of the, the way of dealing with uh, Kubernetes native stuff. Um, also, one of the controversial but sometimes popular features of Spring is going to be auto wiring support, whether that's with um, attributes or things just working automatically. I'll look for that kind of support. Um, we're contemplating working with functions. Uh, there's been a lot of development in that space. So we are considering throwing our hats into that ring and seeing if we can't uh, provide a, a more um, 
portable abstraction that fits over top of more and more. All right. Here's some contact info for how to find me, uh, whether it's on the steel to OSS GitHub, uh, you can get to our Slack. I forgot to put a link to our website, but it is just steeltoe.io. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I don't tweet a whole lot, but I will respond if you uh, have a question for me. And I think that's about it. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate that. And thanks to all of you. We made it. Here it is, spring one, the hay is in the barn, we are done. Now, for those of you that looked at Tim's background and went, oh yeah, Star Wars, guess what? It's season two coming out October 30th. Now, if you're sitting there going, but that's so far away, what am I gonna do with myself? Well, first and foremost, you're gonna find all the videos from the sessions that we had over the last two days are eventually gonna find their way onto our wonderful YouTube channel. Watch for that here in the next day or three or 10. I don't know exactly how long it'll take, but I also want to take time to point you to tanzu.vmware.com slash developer, where you'll find a whole bunch of developer resources as well as a link to tanzu.tv. Yes, indeed, this is not the end of spring content for us. No, sir. We have spring one tour virtual, which we've been doing roughly monthly here since uh, I guess it was May or so when we kicked that off. We try to do that once a month to sort of bring a little bit of that spring one tour flavor back since we can't actually come out and see you all in person. But we also have a bunch of sort of TV shows, if you will, that we put out. We typically have one just about every day of the week. It is streamed live to Twitch, but then it also ends up on our YouTube channel. We have Tanzu Tuesdays, where we do lots of demos and things like that, but we also do some coding things on Wednesdays. We've got, thank God it's Kubernetes on Fridays. I'm about to kick off a new series uh, roughly titled Between Chair and Keyboard that will be coming here at the end of September. But lots of fun stuff out there. You can see all the past episodes. So this is not the end of the conversation, simply the beginning. I want to thank all of you for hanging out with us here the last two days. It's been a great experience. We've seen a lot of very positive feedback on Twitter and elsewhere. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Get some rest. And those of you in the States, enjoy your long weekend. Everybody else, have a great day. Cheers. <laughs>